Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. For this special Friday bonus episode, my guest is Scott Abramovich, a filmmaker whose credits include the screenplay for The Calling, which earned him a Canadian Screen Award nomination, and writing and directing Eat Wheaties, a very anxious comedy starring Tony Hale as an ordinary man who derails his entire life, trying to get people to believe he went to college with Elizabeth Banks. I saw it when it played the Whistler Film Festival last December, and now it's available to rent and buy on VOD. You should watch it. Scott picked The Apartment. Billy Wilder and Itzhak Diamond's Oscar-winning 1960 masterwork about the price of upward mobility. Lonely insurance adjuster C.C. Bud Baxter lends out his nearby apartment to executives needing a place to bring their mistresses, and while it helps him move up the corporate ladder, Bud soon finds himself watching helplessly as Fran Kubelik, the elevator operator he adores, is courted by his sleaze of a boss, Sheldrick. Jack Lemmon plays Bud, Shirley MacLaine plays Fran, and Fred McMurray is Sheldrick, and if you need to know anything else, I'm guessing you haven't seen The Apartment. So go see The Apartment and then come back and listen to this episode. This is someone else's movie. Why The Apartment? You know, when I first started getting uh, into the love of film, um, it was this was the first movie that, I, that made me realize, you know, watching Citizen Kane, you could see the visual connective tissue to, you know, the advancements of film. But this was the first movie that I felt the story and tone was really in line with the things that I, uh, I loved uh, of, of the movies that I was watching now, the, you know, the James Brooks films and the Cameron Crowe films. You know, this was the first movie that said, Oh, this is where that tone came from. Um, and so for me that this was the movie that, uh, that defines, I think the, uh, the ideas that, that made me want to write as a, as a, as a filmmaker. Wow. Okay. So what was your first experience of it when like set the stage? How did it happen? Did you watch it on video? Did you see it in the theater? I watched it on video. Um, you know, it was, I think I probably read an article uh, from Cameron about Cameron Crowe uh, and and his love of Billy Wilder before oh, sure. he wrote that, the, the book. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting because I, you know, I never, I never quite connected so many uh, story elements and even visual elements uh, and structural elements that were borrowed. I mean, borrowed is the, you know, is the nice way of, of using it from, from, you know, Jerry Maguire from the, in the apartment, you know, the opening sequence and watching this now in hindsight, it's like that opening sequence and the definition of this world with the voiceover, even the visual setup, it's like, it's, it's take it. It's the same thing. I mean, yeah. the story is obviously very different, but, um, but yeah, I think that's, so I think that's how I, how I found it the first time. Um, and then every, you know, four or five years, it feels like I, I go back and watch it again. And it was interesting to watch it again this week because, you know, I think everyone now is watching movies through this new lens of, you know, what is, what is going to be inappropriate from this generation. And there's obviously there's a lot of mis- misogyny, uh, in the way that the, you know, the men are, uh, using women as, as, uh, objects, but, um, in terms of the, the actual story itself, it, it, it it's and the and the jokes and the threads, you know, so many threads in this dialogue threads. To me, the writing in this is just it's it's perfect. It's perfect in 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 execution. Now, there's there's things that I think you know are problematic from a story standpoint. If you're looking at if you want to nitpick, but just the every story element that is introduced, I think is is inevitably uh, you know tied up in a beautiful way. Yeah. Well, and I think too that there's a baked in protection from the attitudes of the era because the film is commenting on them, right? Because we have a we have characters who are morally compromised but know it, and that lets the film off the hook a little bit. I mean, Bud Baxter is the kind of person who knows that the system is broken but doesn't care, and the arc of the story is about him learning just how complicit he's been in perpetuating the system. And so he gets to come out of it as a better person. And because we're on his side and he's our point of view character, the movie then also acts as a criticism of its entire environment. So we are rooting for the system to change. And also I think the other thing too, is that as dismissive as the characters are of the women around them, Fran Kubelik is so vivid and, and, and real as a three-dimensional human being that it's impossible to agree with them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he, he does something so 
perfect in terms of the idea of, okay, so here's a guy who's letting these, uh, you know, these guys take advantage of him and these women in this apartment. Um, and they do this great thing of, of exposition that explains how he started down this road, you know, and it, and it, and it lets, at least for me, it lets CC Baxter off the hook for the for the moral dilemma. It's that this snowballed out of you know he let a, he let a guy use his apartment uh, when he had a wedding and he needed somewhere to change, and then another guy asked and another guy asked and, and once you say yes to one guy, you know how do you say no? Um, and it's it's played as a joke, but it, to me it also it's a it's a something I understand where you know I think more when I was a kid this was something that like you know if you're nice to if you're nice to people um, it's so easy to be taken advantage of and and when you do say yes once you know that line becomes harder to 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 stop um, and it moves and so for this yes it's a it's a it's it's a moral dilemma that I think is made you know at the time I think it was much more funny than it is now. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. I mean, corporate right. culture at the time, and it's funny the the casting of Jack Lemmon does so much as well to just paper over that potential conflict because you look at this guy and you can absolutely see his entire life before this. He's always like, there's a little hunch in the way he acquiesces to people. He's, he's a beta guy. He's not even a beta male. He's, he's kind of a, a sexual uh, compared to everybody else because everyone's having sex in his house, but him and Jack Lemon plays not quite humiliation but not quite pride either in his status. And I found that fascinating the last time I saw it, just realizing that he is negotiating the very nature of, I don't know, this is going to sound dumb, but like he's negotiating who Bud is based on who he's talking to at the office. And then as soon as he's out of the office, he show up, he just folds up completely. Um, yeah, he's, he can't even put sentences together around Ms. Kubelik and, and he doesn't know how to talk to the doctor and he doesn't know how to talk to anybody he meets because he only has the identity that he's been given at the office. And like his, his introduction, his voiceover is more confident than his character, which I find really fascinating. He's not talking to anybody. I mean, maybe he's talking to Fran down the line to explain who he was, but that narration sets us up to expect someone who is more confident, more in charge, more controlling. And then the minute he opens his mouth in the real world, it's like, Oh no, he he's terrified of everything. Yeah. And it's, it, 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 it has a layer though, that I think is, uh, is present um, when he's alone, because when he's alone, he's a lot smarter than he is when he's around other people. Oh, that's um, true. And, and he's, he's so more charming. Tr- yeah. And it, absolutely. And also when he's drunk, you know, in the in the office party scene, he has a little confidence. He's had a couple drinks. And when he's with Fran, he's suddenly this charming, charismatic leading man who's like, you know, one step ahead with, you know, with his plan of, you know, how they're going to go out and what they're going to do. Um, but at the same time, you know, when he's with other people, he's trying to please and he's and he's submissive, um, which is, by the way, a, a very understandable trait that I that made me like this character and connect with this character, because I think, you know, building confidence as a as a as a man in a world uh or a woman in a world where you're you know at the bottom of the chain you know it's something that i think you know kids feel it in school socially and i think when you start working somewhere in whatever office or whatever atmosphere you're in when you start at the bottom you know some people have this organic ability to just throw themselves out there as like an alpha and and and, and be aggressively uh, confident but most people i think are are like cc baxter where they're you know they're they're manipulate they're be, they're able to be manipulated very easily by the people above them. And that's, I think, the, to- the toxic male culture that, you know, that we've now seen kind of come out that's been existing in, in Hollywood and everywhere, really. Um, you know, it, it's present in this film, but we're wa- but by watching it through Baxter's perspective, it's it, it allows us, I think, to understand that that the lens that we're seeing this through is is not the negative sort of thing. I think we're seeing this as a, it was a bad thing then, uh, and and we're never we're never with any of those characters uh, who are using you know him and who are using these women. Yeah, being deferential is is Bud's way of surviving, but it isn't helping him. Right, like he hasn't advanced, he hasn't gone anywhere, and it isn't until he connects to Sheldrake or until Sheldrake hears about his thing, and immediately decides to take advantage of it and just keeps taking. I mean, there's, you know, Fran has the speech about there are people who take and there are people who get took. Um, But she doesn't 
she almost doesn't need it because it's so obvious that the movie understands it. And also that Bud kind of gets what's going on with Sheldrake. He immediately falls into the lackey role with him. And it works for him because it gets him promoted and it gets him moved up and people know who he is and everything else is going well for him. But, you know, the idea of Fred McMurray playing the absolute devil in, in this Faustian bargain is so unsettling and, and was so unsettling to people in 1960. Apparently he was getting hate mail and people would yell at him on the street for being a bad man, um, which, you know, obviously they hadn't seen Double Indemnity and well, Welder has this ability to bring it out in him. Well, that's his career is fascinating when you look at it and the casting in this is, I think it's it's perfect because of it. Um, but, you know, and then he goes on from this and then he's, you know, going going back to this fatherly sitcom roles and he's doing the Disney movies. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's like he he does this kind of roller coaster thing with with his persona in, a, in the perfect way. Um, but in the film, it, it, it works perfectly because you can see how in those scenes with his kids, he's he's not really present. And this it, it's such a perfect performance from from a guy who you imagine is the, the fatherly type. But his, you know, the essence of this character is so uh, evil in, in, in at his core. It's it, it works so well. <laughs> yeah, it's the sense that he's performing the version of a good person. Right. But he can turn yes. it off at will, which is so unsettling. And in contrast to Lemon, who is not performing anything because he wears every single emotion on his skin, um, it's really jarring. And, and of course, the lighting works in their favor and too. And, and, and McMurray is designed in, in every shot as the more powerful, looming, imposing character. And, and Lemon is just shrinking away from him and cowering. Um, it's almost like a Dracula Renfield kind of relationship. I, I started thinking maybe it's the black and white lighting schemes where you're just like, this kind of looks like it could be a horror movie. And then of course, Fran tries to kill herself and it is a horror movie. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to talk about that, that storyline. Um, but, but before we get off the black and white thing, I think, you know, this movie you know, at the time, I think, you know, he was one of the last people still using, still shooting in black and white. But this movie, I was thinking to myself as I'm watching this, would this movie work as well as it does in color? And I really don't think it would. Um, because the, you know, so many of these little story elements that that make that, that connect us to CC Baxter in this film are, are, are on this line, this thin line of uh, that, that uh, this tone works that if 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 you just move a, a smidge this way or that way, um, it, it's lost. And they did that. I don't know if um, if you saw that Amy Heckerling movie uh, Loser, um, which was it's the exact story. They, yeah, I haven't, you know, how I haven't seen it credits. since, but yes, I remember then thinking, oh wait a minute, I've been here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and it made me angry. And there's been a few times where I've been in a film that's so uh, so <laughs> transparently, you know, tra taking the the story from no from no to from something. But it doesn't work because uh, of so many small little things. I think you know, taking it out of the corporate world and bringing it into uh, you know um, this sort of college atmosphere, um, it, it the age of these characters doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and the it's it's interesting how the even the um, suicide storyline, which which works to me from Fran's perspective, it works. It's funny the the one story element that I that I watching it again um, that didn't feel that it uh, that it played out uh, right was was CC was Baxter's backstory about him trying to kill himself with it. It's a throwaway story. He gets, yeah. Um, and it's really just meant to set up the final scene with the gun and the champagne, I, I think. Um, I don't think it was meant to be a, a, a major character trait of this guy, that he was suicidal at one point. Um, but it's like when you use suicide or a character who's contemplating suicide or gets close to killing themselves as a story element, that thread is just so thin. And if it's done in the, you know, at the top of a story like Elizabeth town with yeah. camera crows, you know, it, to me, it takes me out. It, it takes me out of the connection to this character. Um, whereas with Fran, it felt like this was just a, uh, you know, between the, the, the drinking that day and the, and the way that that progressed um, down to that, to that, uh, the photo, the Christmas card, it's like, you see, okay, if this woman was going to take these pills, like this was, this was how it was going to happen. Um, cause she doesn't feel suicidal, even though as down as she is about the relationship, um, you know, she feels like she's going to get over it if she's just given time, but the, the suicide doesn't feel, um, like it takes, takes you out of the movie, but you know, loser, the, that doesn't work, doesn't work in any way for me. Yeah. Well, well, and also, of course, as you said, they're in college, they don't have the 
they don't have the mileage to be that disillusioned yet. I mean, yes, kids get depressed and college is hard, but the characters in the apartment have been ground down by another decade of life yeah, absolutely. And, and, and loneliness and emptiness. And I, look, I, I think the, what, what translates fine for a loser, not to talk more about that movie, but the, you know, these, the, the college assholes, uh, for lack of a better word, um, you know, compared to the corporate assholes. I mean, those are, are I buy those guys. Yeah. Well, uh, and they're and the I same buy- person, right? Like they're not going to evolve or change. They're going to be that person when they're 30 and 40. Yes, exactly. So that works, but but if you're following the the lead, the lead has to have lived enough to justify this, uh, you know, this vulnerability that that Jack Lemmon pr- presents so well. It's like you that's that comes that comes with time. Um, and when you and when you're down on your, you know, well, he's not quite down. I mean, he's getting promoted, but this idea of you know the loneliness. Uh, it matters more when you're, you know, when you're in your thirties than it does when you're in college. I don't think anyone feels bad for a lonely college kid. <laughs> yeah. Well, or <laughs> there's some, not as a, yeah. And there's so many of them. Like, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's not a state of alienation that is particularly um, specific for lack of a better term. Like when we, when we see Bud Baxter, we know who he is, you know, this guy who's now making spaghetti with a tennis racket, which again, says everything about who he is. Um, his throwaway about, what is it? I'm, I'm a pretty good cook, but I'm a terrible housekeeper. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that this man could lose the strainer in his apartment kitchen somewhere and have to do what he does, but still in the moment, rationalize it. And, and Lemon's refusal to apologize for any of the really weird stuff in that space is something that I love. It's just the sense that he's becoming his own valet. He has to keep the place clean. He's cleaning up after other people's assignations and, and all the other uncomfortable stuff that he's hiding, but that he refuses to see himself as the victim here until he realizes just how much damage is being done in like in his name, basically. That's fascinating to me. The way that Lemon's disillusionment isn't one moment. It's this, this slow erosion of his denial until finally he just can't deny it any further. So I guess technically it is one moment, but it's set up throughout the entire film. And it's, uh, you know, it's so fascinating from the writing perspective, you know, Billy Wilder, I think, and, and Izzy Diamond, you know, their, their dialogue is, this is the sharpest it is in all their films. I think to me, I think so. Yeah. This is the peak. Um, Just the way that every thread connects, but you know, he's not, I, I don't think, uh, you know, he's much of a visual director as he is a, as, a, as a, a writer director in terms of dialogue. But yet the, the moment that Jack Lemmon, uh, you know, has that realization with the broken mirror and the compact mirror, like it's such a perfect visual that in a movie that's that's, you know, overloaded with perfect dialogue that that the moment that really matters is a visual moment. And it's so it's so well executed. Um, it, it, it makes the effectiveness of it off the charts for me. I could, I could watch that scene, uh, you know, over and over and over again. And just, just his, his natural uh, performance of it, um, which is something that I, that from what I, you know, that Jack, uh, the Billy Wilder um, Cameron Crowe book, you know, talks a little bit about Jack Lemmon kind of as a performer um, and how he started, he started as a really energetic um, and over actor. Uh, and I think you know, over time he learned how to, how to be, still you know in the moments that needed him to be still um because you know the physical comedy of this of the performance is there it's like even in the opening shot where he's like doing that head thing with the typewriter yeah. um the head nodding like you know his ability to, to make the physical moments sing uh when he has a cold it's like that <laughs> it's it's beautiful um you know and it's funny because like the the small touches of this movie like when he's cleaning up the martinis and he takes that you know the drink for himself uh, you know the that's left over like all the, these little flourishes are just you know perfection perfection yeah. Yeah. yeah and it also reads as the as the actions of someone trying to make himself happy any way he can right like delighting in the world around him because otherwise there's nothing like he, he is a single man who's not seeing anybody he's usually alone in his apartment, except when he's forced out of it by circumstances that he contributed to. This is a guy who doesn't have much joy in his life. And so he keeps coming up with ways to invent it, which um, I just, I love that stuff. I love, it's like Steve Martin in Roxanne amusing himself as he's walking down the street, just muttering little things. And uh, it's a step away from Popeye, I guess, in, in, in its origin where you're just 
because no one will talk to you, you talk to yourself and you, you create a world that you can engage with. But the tragedy of it all and the, the, this, you know, it's a smiling clown, call it whatever you want to call it, but that, that mechanic of narrative where you're watching someone try so hard to deny how unhappy he is. How do you not sympathize with him? How do you not go to that guy? And when you cast Jack Lemmon, it's like half the work is already done for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the other thing that he, that's done so well in this movie is that, um, you know, he uses, he uses the, uh, the plot points of um, mistaken, not so much mistaken identity, but I, you know, I can't stand particularly romantic comedies because it's the, it's the genre that it's been used most. But when a, when a, a lie is the foundation of uh, what's the obstacle in a relationship, right. you know, the beauty about the relationship between between Fran and, and C.C. Baxter is that th- there's no lies between them. There's information that's unknown, but the only lies that he's really a part of, besides the you know what's going on with these guys using his apartment, they're not his lies. Um, but it's the neighbor. You know, he lets his neighbor think that he's uh, that he's this cat and sort of sleeping with all these women. Um, and so the, the, there is some comedy that plays out with that. But um, but it never it never affects the core relationship of the movie. And that to me is is so important because, you know, the second that you think that a character is lying to the to to the relationship uh, character that they're trying to, you know, they're trying to woo or, or, or trying to create a, something real with. I, I don't care anymore. Right. Um, but I care about Baxter because, you know, he's he's always up front with with Fran. Um, you know, even the, the girl that he picks up, the drunk girl uh, with the jockey <laughs> right. the husband in jail in Cuba in the bar. I mean, it's a, it's nonsense. But he never really, you know, he, he never uh, he never lies um, for his own benefit. All the things he does for his own benefit, it's other people lying. Um and he's just kind of going along with it. So it makes you, it makes you, it makes you care about that character just, just more because it's, you know, there's no reason not to. Yeah. Well, and also it builds the the core relationship um, because they are completely honest with one another. Like, but and but and Fran don't have any reason to present false friends. Like the the they don't even have. I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this. The the thing about dating is that we all perform the best versions of ourselves, right? Like we're trying to, that's why everybody says, I want to be the person my wife thinks I am, or I want to be the person my husband thinks I am. It's because that's the person we showed them initially. And we know that's not true. Like we know what the lies were or the the misrepresentations or the just being a little bit better, being slower to irritate or being less sarcastic. I mean, I know I, it's all, there's all sorts of stuff that I'm sure I was doing unconsciously just to be more presentable. Right. And they're not doing that. So they actually are showing each other their best selves, which I find just marvelous. They're able to be vulnerable. She can be depressed in front of him. He can be angry in front of her. They can share these truths because there's no expectations. And that's how you fall in love with someone. And it's just so, it's it's floating under the surface of the movie. It's never articulated, but it's there. And it's just so great. I remember you saying something uh about on another episode when you with punch drunk love about how that movie affected you and the way you oh, looked yeah. at relationships. And it's funny, I had, it had a, it had a similar, but different effect on me, I think, um, you know, and what you see, what you see of these characters that you can then, you know, kind of enlighten yourself about and about how you're presenting yourself to the world um, and the things that you're holding back or letting out that maybe aren't necessarily uh, helping your relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me watching the apartment, I think that, you know, there were, there were certainly things that about Jack Lemon that I saw in myself that, that I think, you know, there have been times in my life where I went along with things uh, that I maybe shouldn't have. Um, and, you know, teaching you to kind of just to, to say no at certain times, you know, I'm, I, I was around, I was around people who were, uh, you know, drinking and doing drugs young and, 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 and it was something that uh, as, I went along with, it. I didn't do it necessarily myself, but I was around, around it. And in cars where you know, people were hot boxing in, and I, I was very submissive in that way. Um, and, I, and I look back at those times and I think it's, it's interesting that the, the CC Baxter in me was, uh, was there and, I ha- and learning to, to figure out when it is the time to say no. And when it is the time to say, you know, you guys go do that. Uh, and I, I don't want to be a part of it. I mean, it's an important part of anyone's life. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, I, I, I guess my thing was always that it was always just, well, if you're doing that, I'll be over here. I was never that interested in it, but I'm square. Like, I'm just, I'm not, 
I'm not an, an adventurous person by nature, but the the feeling I took away from Punch Drunk Love and from and from the apartment from other movies is, is less things not to do, but more things to aspire to. And I, that's it. Like that was it for Punch Drunk Love for me. It was it was really more about a clarifying moment of understanding that this film was explaining the experience I was having while I was having it, or I was just at the right moment for that. I was perfectly placed. The sense that you are seeing something that knows you, that the movie is speaking directly to you, is so weird and and electric when it happens. And yeah, wow, I can imagine seeing the apartment and having that response just because it is so specific that people are going to respond to it like achingly on some level if they connect with Bud. On the other hand, if they connect with Sheldrake, they're just they're doomed. <laughs> yeah, I don't I I don't know. I don't think people are are uh are watching that movie and connecting with Sheldrake because they're not watching that movie if they are Sheldrake. Yeah. <laughs> they're I, more I, worried about the person sitting next to them and how they're gonna get in their pants. <laughs> yeah. I saw someone refer to him as morally ambiguous. And it's like, no, not really. His morals are fairly clear. Yeah, I, I, you know, the one thing that that movie does fairly with a Sheldrake character, and I look, I think everyone's met Sheldrakes in their life, um, is that he is so transparent about what he wants and how he wants it when he's with, um, when he's with Baxter and he's with the guys. Um, and look, I, 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 I had. I had people in my life who had that mentality, I think, you know, particularly when you're younger, uh, of women as con- conquests and just this not worrying about, you know, the other pre- people in your life, other relationships and what it's going to do to, you know, to that. Um, but what, what, I, what I felt was at least grounded about that was that it, it, it never it never made you feel like he was uh, that he cared <laughs> in the, in the perfect way with Fran for Fran's perspective, when we're watching it through her eyes, you know, you, you see how, how manipulated she has been and how stuck she is to, you know, and, and, and in order to get out of that, you know, she needs something drastic to happen. Now, whether it needed to be a suicide, I wonder if there's a version of this movie where, where you take the suicide out um, and, and what is the, what is that moment that, that gets her away from that. Cause even then she's still, she's still kind of hopeful for that relationship in a strange way. When she's, when she's um, convalescing at, uh, in the apartment, yeah. like she still wants him back some way, which, which, which is interesting. But um, I, I, I'm curious if there was a way around the suicide in the story. Cause yeah. that's something that like, I just, it's so hard when, when that becomes a storyline as, as deep as it is to, to then have that same feelings I think that you and I both have had with films before, um, you know, cause depression is something I think, you know, certainly if you've, if you're, if you've been, you know, depressed clinically, then, then that's something you connect with, but even, you know, mild, just sadness and melancholy for lost relationships. And if you have strong emotions, you can then you can connect, but then, but the idea of the suicide is so specific and so dark. That's like, yeah. I wonder if that's why, I th- I wonder if that's why the movie is a classic. Like if because it goes that extra dimension into something truly dark and and it doesn't treat it as funny. Like it suddenly all the joy and comedy just goes away and we're trapped in this space with someone who is dying and someone else who doesn't know what to do. And the desperation that comes out of of Lemon's performance and the yeah, the weight of the sadness. I'd forgotten how long the scenes are and how much time it spends on her convalescence because it's not just, I, I, I think now if you were trying to do something like this, you would just have somebody get really, really drunk and maybe sick, but that's it, right? Like she would, and we've seen that in romantic comedies where people just do something self-destructive, but nothing permanent, nothing as dangerous as, as what Fran does. And because it's 1960 and because it's still kind of a post-war go-go economy, it's the one time that the movie really demonstrates the casualties of that, of the idea of blowing past everything. And when you find someone who just can't and is, is broken so badly by a disappointment that she tries to end her own life, that I think the, the genius of Wilder and Diamond is that they don't just brush it off that that it's a thing that they will that these two characters especially that that fran and bud will never forget it's with them forever and it's why i think they can move on and have a relationship because they've seen that they both endured that and it's not the florence nightingale effect where she falls in love with him because he took care of her she's still pretty dismissive of him for like subsequently and he reminds her of this low point but eventually because they've seen that 
version of each other, it lets them rebuild. I, I, I do think that you need to be as dark as that in a movie this light, because otherwise it is just a forgettable, fun comedy about people cheating on each other. Right. The hour, the hour and a half version of this movie, it, you could see it and you, you know, and it would not do the, the story justice. Yeah. Um, it would, the ending wouldn't, wouldn't feel organic. Um, it's interesting. And, that, and that something you said triggered that there is another lie that, that bothered me that Baxter tells. Um, and it's the only time he lies to Fran is when he's lying about Sheldrake's uh, care for her. When she, after she has the overdose experience, right. she, he's telling her that, that Sheldrake, you know, was asking about her and that it's interesting that, that, you know, I've, you see that you see that uh, that element in another in other movies where the character lies to someone to try and help you know to try and spare them from uh, from emotional trauma. And I, I think in this situation, somebody coming off of a of a suicide, uh, and, and the way the doctor kind of warns warns him about this being something that she might do again, it oh, yeah. it justifies it. Oh yeah. It oh, and he's doing it for the best possible reason, right? Which is to keep her from doing it again and and from losing all hope. But yeah, it's it's a white lie that I think that's maybe the point of it too, that that's the kind of lie he's willing to tell because it, it might help her and he already yeah. cares. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Dreyfus character is interesting, both of them, the, the husband and the wife. Yeah. I mean, they're used for comedic effect, but he got nominated for an Oscar for that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, who was Jack uh, Crucian? Apparently he, uh-huh. filled, he filled in uh, for someone else who was supposed to do it and then didn't. Oh, really? I wonder yeah. who that was. Oh, it's in the trivia section of the IMDb somewhere. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. But um, He's a is, Canadian Jew, by the way. I did not know that. I, I know. I, I saw that in, somewhere, and it was fascinating. There's only been a handful of Canadian Jews who have been nominated on the performance side. Really? Yeah. Uh, according to the IMDb, he wrote the role for Lou Jacoby. Um, oh. but, but Jacoby was performing on Broadway, and his producers wouldn't release him, so Jack Crucian played the role. Interesting. Yeah. Lou Jacoby yeah. would have, yeah, Lou Jacoby probably would have been a little more comic. I, you know, he, he's the, there's a comedy that's, uh, that's going on here that is, that is very specific and very Jewy in, in the best way possible. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, the, um, the, the fact that it's, it's a satire of a very, very waspy world, again, is the kind of thing that Wilder could do in his sleep, but, he had a knack for it, right? There's a, it's, it's sort of Yiddish theater kind of thing. Yeah. And, and the, the word mensch as the, as the turn in his, in his arc is something that I think is, is nice. It's simple. It's not too, uh, too Jewy. I, I, that was another episode that I, I really enjoyed a year as we're talking with, uh, um, Emma Seligman about, uh, the person, you know, the, how Jews were, have been, shown on film and, and, and the organic, like the real, like getting into, it. I think this is, this is the other version of that. This is like the, the sticky kind of stereotypical version that we're typically, that we're used to seeing, but it's done tastefully here. Yeah. Well, it it connects in my mind to Casablanca to the way that the refugee characters who are very clearly Jewish are allowed in some cases, like the Hungarian couple to be just really, really broad and comic reliefy. And then you come back to uh, Victor Laszlo, who may or may not be Jewish, but has absolutely just come out of a concentration camp. And he's allowed to have the gravitas and, and the severity of someone who's experienced that while never making it clear to the audience in 1942, who any of these people are or why the Nazis don't like them exactly. But here it's Wilder just building on all of that. Um, Double Indemnity is another one where it's pretty clear that he doesn't have a lot of respect for wasps with money. Uh, he just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the the names the names uh, are interesting too. That Dreyfus is such a such a specifically Jewish name. That's you know he's not he's not he's definitely not shying away from the from the use of of the Jew character of the part of that character. Yeah, uh, and the accents the accents feel so uh, so big. <laughs> yeah, and in contrast <laughs> to people like Baxter and Sheldrake, and what was the other one? Yeah, there's a Vanderhoff in there somewhere. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. It also um, kind of quietly others Shirley MacLaine as Fran, because Kubelik is not exactly a name that rolls off these people's tongues. No, for sure not. I, I remember reading in that, I think it was in that uh, Cameron Crowe book, that he chose his names based on real people. All these people were, uh, Kubelik, I think, was a violinist, a famous violinist. Yeah. Um, and Sheldrake was a, a, um, 
uh, Eddie Sheldrake was a point guard on um, on the UCLA basketball team in the 50s. And he used that name in a bunch of movies. And he named, I think C.C. Baxter was named after his first AD, but a guy they called Buddy, C.C., I don't know, C.C. something. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to see that the, the way that he used the things that I think he connected with in you know real world because names all these small little details like they they really make a big difference it's oh yes yeah I think about directors who try to come up with eccentric names and almost always overdo it like they just don't like I mean the perfect example I think is somebody like Michael Bay naming a character in Transformers Sam Witwicky which is not a real human being name but sounds wacky right like it's it's designed to let you know that the movie is going to be a bit off or strange or goofy and it's a michael bay film so that doesn't happen instead you just wonder why these characters exist with these silly names and then or somebody like paul thomas anderson who will just come up with these bespoke names that are absolutely perfect for the world that he's built the world that he's created um but are also like recognizably human names and then there's wilder who just finds the milieu and builds it out and you don't even think twice about it. Maybe it's Mil- maybe it's Diamond, maybe it's Wilder, maybe it's the two of them together. But they just had an ear for reality no matter what they were doing. I mean, Sunset Boulevard, right? Like it's just every single person is perfectly noirishly named in just 10 degrees off normal. Uh, but they but their names become icons. Uh, and or they build out the iconography of the world of Hollywood in the 1950s, and and you don't question a single thing, or or some like it hot where of course Marilyn Monroe's character is named Sugarcane, but her last name is Kowalczyk, right? Right, just for the for the derailment of the bouncy sexuality of it. They just they just always knew, and it's amazing. Yeah, I, I it makes me it makes me love the this movie even more because it's it, those details are are impossible to uh, manipulate when they're when they don't feel right they don't feel right and it's, you know the 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 other thing that I remember reading about in that book was the um was Cameron Crowe asked him a que- this question I was like I, I imagine him sitting there and thinking to himself do I ask this do I ask this but he asked him have you did you ever feel like that you never quite rose to that peak of the apartment in your career again and he answered honestly that yes that he that he feels like he failed from that moment on to to ever get back to that um to that you know that peak um and you know so so many of the filmmakers that i love that connected me to to billy wilder in the first place you know james brooks and cameron crowe you know i think you can look at at some of the films after their peaks as well as um as, as in the same way that they never quite, they never quite connected with the soul of these characters. This, there, there's some brilliant writing in, in all of their films, their best and their worst, obviously, but, um, but the, the ability to like make a character feel human, despite the kind of story elements like this, like, you know, Jack Nicholson in, in As Good As It Gets, I think is a perfect example. You know, if you look at the that character, you know, there's there's flaws in there that it, that could be problematic, but the soul of that character, it, it works, um, you know, and then you and then you look at some of the later films, the one he did with Owen Wilson and, uh, and Reese Witherspoon and Paul Rudd. Oh, how do you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like th- there's pieces of that movie that really work. And then at the same time, there's 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 a missing soul in something, and and I don't know how to articulate, but I, you know, Billy Wilder, I think you know one of the part of that answer was casting. I think was was you know he never quite got the right people in the right roles, and I don't know if that's a crutch or if that's true because yes, Jack Lemmon in this movie is is so perfectly cast that I think it makes the movie work. Um, but at the same time, the movie w- would have worked with somebody else, I think, and maybe it wouldn't have worked as perfectly, but you know, the, the writing and the, and the, um, the structure of it, I think is just, it's just well done. Um, yeah, I wonder, I'm just, I'm going over his filmography now as you're talking and just realizing all the stuff I thought followed the apartment was actually before it. Uh, I thought love, I love in the afternoon and witness for the prosecution were later, but they were three years earlier. Um, I mean, I knew that. Sunset Boulevard was 10 years before that and Double Indemnity was 44 and all of this. But yeah, subsequently it is. It's just him chasing the same the same vibe and rearranging things. One, two, three, Irma LaDuz, Kiss Me Stupid, The Fortune Cookie. Private Life of Sherlock Holmes is fascinating. And I, I think I would love to see the version he wanted to make because we never have 
there's like three different cuts of it and they're all kind of unsatisfying. But yeah, that idea, that idea of that movie, I think it was ahead of its time. Um, we've seen we've seen so many better executed versions of that type of story. But at the time, I think it was revolutionary or it feels like it was. I think it was. Yeah, certainly for 1970, the murder by decree was still four or five years ahead. And, and what was the one that Gene Wilder did? Sherlock Holmes, a smarter brother. That's late 70s. Yeah. But yeah, the, the revisionist Holmes wasn't we I don't think people were ready for it yet. Yeah. And now, of course, it's everywhere. But, oh, yeah. But yeah, all of his, like, maybe I'm trying to figure out in my head, like, if I made the apartment, would I even want to work again? <laughs> would I want, would I, <laughs> well, that's the, I would think I be paralyzed, there's, there's, right? Like by the. Well, well there's an element to that. Look, I, I, I'm the greatest Cameron Crowe fan, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest. And, and I think he's, well, I'm, I don't know this, but I feel like he hasn't written anything, you know, he's directed, but he hasn't written his own film, I think, since, uh since Elizabeth town, uh, was that the last one he, he wrote was Aloha um, one of, one of his scripts. Oh, Aloha he wrote, yeah. I think, yeah, he did write that. And then, and then he went off and did the, we bought a zoo and um, you know, and, and which he didn't write. And, and right. wrote, he's a, I don't think he wrote much, maybe one or two episodes. Um, but I think when you, when you write something perfect, like, like Jerry Maguire, um, which to me is a perfect movie. Um, it's, it's hard to, <laughs> to keep going with that. It's like, it's, it, it, maybe it is paralyzing. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, you know, it may be easier to go do documentaries with musicians that you love and, 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 and almost famous too is also perfect in so many ways. And that's another movie that uses suicide, uh, as a, uh, in the way, in an organic way, a suicide attempt uh, with Penny Lane. Like it's, it, it, it feels organic to that character. You, you understand why she gets to, as low as she does. Um, yeah, and because also- we're seeing it through the eyes of a kid, ultimately, right? Like that, that excuses a lot of the, the psychological complexity that we might need if it was a, if it was Penny Lane's movie rather than, than his. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you here, but not at right. all. No, no, I, I was, I was just at the end of that thought of just this paralyzing feeling of, you know, when you make something perfect, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. And James Brooks, you know, James Brooks too. He, well, he, but he, I give him, you know, he kept writing everything he's done. Um, you know, after, after, I mean, broadcast news to me is is perfect. Um, but as good as it gets is is incredible too, right? It, 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 for what it, for what it's trying to say and the challenges of. You know, that's the tone, the tone of those movies and the apartment, I think, is the perfect example is you can take storylines that might feel like they they're veering towards, uh, you know, towards pathos or towards, um, you know, towards sugar. Um, And if you if you if you run that wave right, um, you never get too far and it works. But the second that you go too far and that to me was what Elizabethtown was like that, you know, him killing him, trying to kill himself at the beginning of that movie. Just I was I was out. Um, yeah. and, and same, same thing with that, that softball movie, like the, the, the way that, uh, the, that Owen Wilson characters is just so much of, uh, the sex part of it. And that's, it's funny. Irma LaDuce, I think suffers from that. Like, you know, the, the more into sex you get these characters as a, as a, something that they want or need, the harder it is to then feel like they're, the, it, the harder it is to play with that same tone. The sweetness doesn't come as, as organic. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's because if you're going to create a character who is having a lot of sex and it's not with the same person, then the audience, even if the characters in the movie don't judge, the audience is going to start to see it as superficial. Even if you know, like, I'm thinking of a, a dramatic treatment of it, like um, like Steve McQueen's Shame, which is just nothing but graphic sexual activity and alienation. And I think there, there's something in there that I really found powerful. And I think it's a good movie in its way. But I could feel people turning off because it was empty. And it's like, that is, that is the point. But if you make a comedy about it and it's about the superficiality of it, uh, it's really hard to get people to, to turn and take it seriously. Unless it's something like, what was the example I was thinking of? Like Saturday night fever, where all of a sudden a real relationship blossoms out of all of this casual everything, but it's not like, it's not based in sex. It's based in the display of masculinity and femininity and everything else that was going on in discos in the seventies. So you have that world that excuses it. But I think Wilder's genius and Diamond's, because it's structural, is that we never see what's happening in the apartment, ever. Like, we do not get to see the dates, and we don't get to see the aftermath. We get to, we get to see, well, that's not true. We get to see the psychic aftermath with, with Fran, but we don't see the people leave. Like, we don't see what happens when men take their dates in. 
And that lets it all be abstract because that puts us on Bud's side because that's how he perceives it. Right. right. And if it's we had to see it. The only people that you see kissing on screen are extras. I think in the in the office party, uh, we well, we never even see Fran and, and CC Baxter kiss, which I'm curious if that was something that they shot and, and decided not to use at the end of the movie. I wonder, maybe. I mean, they were pretty I know they were insane about the dialogue. That they, they there's like there's a story of a like a 20 minute argument over whether or not uh, Bud could say yes twice because it was a deviation. And the two times that um, that Lemon improvises, he doesn't do it with dialogue. It's like when he's singing to himself or something else like that, there are gestures and things that were added, but they were very, very exacting about the script. Interesting. So, yeah. That, yeah. Well, what, you know, sometimes I think the, um, the specificity to dialogue is, is, uh, is meaningful. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I wonder Tarantino is pretty specific with his dialogue too, I think. Um, and, and, it, and it, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting that I think so many of these um, these filmmakers that that have this through line for me, at least, you know, the uh, Brooks and uh, Cameron Crowe and Billy Wilder and, and Diamond together, um, their dialogue is so specific. And and there's lines that are clearly scripted in the best way possible, where you know they're meant to stick with you. You know, uh, you had me at hello, and the way and the thread of it, right? The, the and and I think. You know, I'm curious how many line readings he actually gives, um, you know, as a director, because it's because those those speeches in all these movies, you know, uh, Albert Brooks and Broadcast News, uh, uh, they're so the delivery of them is so pitch perfect um, that, you know, you wonder how many takes because these directors, I think they're all pretty. Although while there's the opposite, but Cameron Crowe and James Brooks are, are, are kind of like in the Judd Apatow group of where they just shoot for months and they, um, you know, what, what they end up with, I think is, feels very specific, but I'm curious how much they actually lose along the way. That's, you know, right. been found in the editing room, but while there was editing, while he was shooting this, I think there was, I read somewhere like a week or two weeks that they edited the apartment, which is crazy to me. Wow. I mean, I guess if you just don't sleep, but it's <laughs> it's a, such a complicated film in terms of its structure and its editing. I, they couldn't have shot it in sequence. So, yeah, Jesus. I, I think it was 50 editing days and a week of editing is what or close to a week of editing um, while editing during the pro, during the right. production. Um, but having it having it like I think I guess the movies back then were being churned out at a pace that that's much quicker than it is now. I suppose. But, like, you know, I, I, my favorite story is about Spielberg getting video dailies of Jurassic Park while he was shooting Schindler's List and how oh, in God. any way those two films maintain a, a <laughs> consistent tone. It's, Despite that, that's incredible to me, that just that you can do that with your brain. And I think it happened with uh, Amistad and Saving Private Ryan as well. Like he was cutting one while he was shooting the other. And either you can do that with your brain and just turn it off and be the machine that it needs to be for looking at dailies and cutting, and then go back to the completely different experience that you're working on the next day. Or you just melt down and don't work for three or four years between these things. And Wilder just never stopped, right? He just kept chugging along. Yeah. And, and how he went from tone to tone is, is fascinating too. Like his, you know, he's a rare filmmaker that, that excelled in, in multiple genres uh, as much as genres were, you know, were affected at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I remember the idea for the apartment came from a brief encounter and the idea was just, yes, you know, yeah. the man sit, sleeping in the bed that's been used by somebody else, the warm, the warm bed of others. Um, but that's another interesting movie. When you're looking at that as a launching point to this, it's like there's, I don't think there's any sex in that movie either, right? In Brief Encounter? Yeah. No, uh, do they no. Connect, do they ever have sex? I don't think they do. I think it's just like. It's an emotional affair. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's implied that they would have had someone not come home. But right. yeah, uh, we did an episode on that too. That was a pretty good one. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear that one. Who was, yeah. who was the filmmaker? Quinn Armstrong, who made a found footage movie. Uh, called Survival Skills, which is really interesting. It's an 80s police tape, uh, like a, a like a police recruit. So you want to be a police officer kind of videotape, but it it's it's really interesting. Um, it's, so it's on VOD now. You should definitely check it out. But yeah, it's available. I think Gravitas picked it up and released it. In, so what uh, was the, so there was no connection between Brief Encounter? I can't imagine. <laughs> no, that. no. Oh, that's right. We should get back into this. Um, it was a like basically a core film for him. It was a discovery of how movies could work and and could be made. And I think the contrast too between how austere the film is and how 
much emotion is just roiling around inside of it because it is such an incredibly sad, powerful film where almost nothing is declared or 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 shown. Everything is is underneath the, the rib cages of the characters in the yeah. same in much the same way the apartment works. I think, which is the connection for me is that of course Billy Wilder would see Brief Encounter and come away thinking, well, what about the bed? Like, what about that apartment? What what happens there? What is that like? And we get this out of it, which is some small miracle, some big miracle. Absolutely, it's uh, and the tone and the pacing is the, you know the exact opposite of what. <laughs> <laughs> what do you get? Oh yeah, but uh, but it works so perfectly, and it's, it's pre-war and post-war too in a completely different way. I don't know how that works as a mirror image of the film, but it kind of does. I, I don't exactly know because the difference between the UK and the US are so it's, it's just this chasm at that time where you know there's no a brief encounter is a world that is about to be wiped out or pushed away. They had to shoot around damage from the blitz. They had to be careful with, you know, like what they did and didn't show in 1944 or 1946 because the war was over, but they were setting it pre-war. And then with the apartment, you're in a world with the baby boom where with the, you know, the rationing never happened. Damage never happened. The Americans experienced the war as a, as a thing that happened elsewhere. And so they don't have the, gravitas I mean, maybe these guys knew somebody who went to war and didn't come back but that's it that's it's all in the past and they're pushing towards this is the problem i have with Mad Men. actually it started to become a, a show about boy isn't it great that we've moved on from this right and the apartment is in it and so its commentary is actually more specific and more precise because it's not trying to demonstrate just how far we've come it's showing how far we need to come but i but i also think that the the idea of the Mad Men is is looking at a guy like Sheldrake in a very different light. It's like here's here's this guy. You you acknowledge the mess he is personally, but then show how great he is at what he does. And that's the apartment never actually talks about what this company. You know, they, we know their insurance company, but we don't actually ever see anyone doing their jobs in in any that's way. True. Which is which is fine. I mean, I can't imagine there would be any there would be anything interesting about an insurance claim or an insurance policy. Uh, but I, but what works with Mad Men for me is that um, it's showing how these people can be exceptional at their job and shape the world yet you know the personal lives are are what they are yeah um, so so there but the 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 aesthetic i think you're right on that it's like the the, the things that are glossy about Mad Men um when you compare it to to the to the aesthetic of the apartment which is also brilliant right like the the way he stages this uh this space oh, yeah. um i remember i remember that there was something about the way that he that first shot of the of the and and I think he uses like children in the background and and cutouts to to show like to, the everything getting smaller as to do the force perspective yeah yeah it's, they're basically puppeteered cutouts in the back it's um it's incredibly elaborate it's actually more elaborate than constructing a real workspace would have been but it actually it's it works so beautifully yeah and and I think I think it, it doing it in that way where where you don't it's it's meant to be so uh so underneath the surface and you're not you're not even supposed to notice it is you know it's brilliant it's like I it's the opposite of um that Charlie Kaufman movie and I can never remember the Oh Synecdoche the, right Yes Synecdoche Is that New how York. you pronounce it I I can never quite do it correctly yeah. I I think of Schenectady the city but it's not that right <laughs> No but it's supposed to sound it's a sound like it's it's supposed to be very close but that, but that, but that, uh, the opposite of that, a uh, construction of something and, and seeing how, seeing how it plays out in, in such beauty and, and poetry, like that movie is, is brilliant. Um, but, you know, the, the way that Mad Men works, I think is the opposite. I think, you know, it's meant to be small um, in, in that way of, um, of realism and the bars in the, in the, in the offices are, are, everything feels like tight. Um, in the apartment, everything feels wide. Like it's, I, I don't know how many close-ups he does. I think most of them are on Fran, but the, but the, the this sort of step back from, from uh, perspective is interesting. It, maybe it's the closer we get to CC Baxter, maybe then those, those elements of little things that maybe are flaws or we can, we, we let them go because we're not as inside. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we are pretty forgiving of all of his flaws, pretty much from the jump, I think, but they make him who he is. Like they, in the end, they're, they're necessary flaws because without him, he would have just been swallowed up by the culture. Mm -hmm. I had this, I had this visual idea that I can, that I was, I didn't have the time to execute. 
uh, on Eat Wheaties, but just this idea of, um, you know, being further, being on the outside looking in for this character to give that perspective. And we just, you know, when you're shooting a movie on 20 days, there's only so many shots that you can really, um, you know, elaborate on it as a setup. Um, but I think with, with the apartment, what you, when you open the movie with that kind of visual motif, um, it lingers, right? It's like, it's got this impact. Uh, and even it's a two over two hour movie, but I, I, you feel, you feel the small man in the big space. Um, and it's, and it sticks. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that does bring us to your own work and, and to eat Wheaties if you wanted to, um, I usually end the podcast by asking if there's anything that someone has pulled or lifted or, or outright stolen from their own work, but Eat Wheaties is such a different film from the apartment that I can't really figure out any connection. I, I do, I do like the sense of alienation that it has, but the focus of your film is a character that no one wants to be around, which is so different from Bud because people are constantly trying to use him. Whereas in Eat Wheaties, we're dealing with somebody the Tony Hale's character who is so focused and so, uh, set on making people believe the thing he believes and getting them to agree with him that he winds up isolating everyone or isolating himself from everyone and alienating everyone around him. Yeah. And I, and I think you're right. There's, there's very little in terms of the, uh, in the central character uh, comparison. I think the, the one thing that I, that I would say I, I tried to emulate from a film like the apartment is, um, is to really, from a t there's a tone there's a tone issue that I think um, I worried about crossing that line between sweetness and uh, and and this depression of a, of a lonely character that that's at the center of the story because that that is a similarity um, but in ter just in terms of finding those small moments that that give us uh, affection for the supporting characters I think that that to me was something that um, that I really was really hyper focused on, uh, you know, the apartment, the, the, the Miss Olsen, I think is, is a perfect example. It's like, you know, she's not on screen for more than a few minutes, but the, the time that she's on screen um, and she, she's a one note character. She's, you know, an ex of, of Shell Drake. And she's somebody who, uh, who, who serves the plot more than she serves herself. There's no arc for her, but, um, but, but you, you, the, the, the way that is, she's treated is very three dimensional. Um, and I, you know, I, I, with Gian, with the, with Sid's assistant, you know, she's, she's a one note character. Um, but you know, and there's a, there's another moment that we cut out that I, that I love of just, you know, where you get a glimpse of her personal life and she's, she's, uh, you know, Sid, Sid comes over and is asking the same questions that he's been asking all the time. You know, did you, did you get my mail? And, you know, and she's just, she's cutting a photo where she's cutting a, a guy out of the photo. This is like four people and she's cutting this guy, this one guy out. And you just get a, you get a sense of this whole, this woman's world and what she's, you know, what she really cares about. And it's not this work and it's certainly not her boss, Sid, who she, you know, she tolerates in the lowest possible way. Um, the other thing is just the way that um, the patients for, uh, for for moments that I think, you know, from an editing standpoint, you could see you could see how cutting cutting certain things out of uh, out of the apartment would have made the pace move. You know, there's the but but the threads wouldn't wouldn't be complete. Like the the best moment for me in the apartment in that in that climax is uh, when when Baxter you know, turns down the job or quits or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's not the giving back the key that, that I care about. It's the taking that off the hat and putting, and putting it on somebody when he walks into the elevator. Um, right. uh, it, there's a moment in the Wheaties towards the end um, where, uh, you know, I don't want to give away too much, but it's, it's a, it's a throwaway line. It's, and I don't even know if, 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 if it, if it connected with you, but it's the, this just a little cat snap. Uh, it's a line that in one of the posts to Elizabeth Banks that he says, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, you remember when Mr. Katz uh, uh, fell asleep in class and someone wrote just a little cat snap on the board? That was me. Um, and then there's this moment, uh, you know, at the reunion where he goes and sees pr what's Professor Katz. I don't know if people get it, but he he and he has this note that he's written and, and he writes just a little cat snap. Um, but it, but the the moment that that it happens, he's already walked out and he walks back in to do this. So I mean, it's a moment that you know I had my editor wanted to cut it, and I think uh, Tony Hale when he saw that first cut, he's like, "You don't need this, you don't need this." But those the, the extra 
touch, I think is something that for the people who get it, I think it'll, it'll feel, uh, it'll feel meaningful. And for the people who don't, I don't think it really matters. Yeah. I mean, it's just all about building the texture that makes the world work, right? Like feeling that it isn't just a set with some actors in it, that there's a world here. It, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the beauty about, you know, the, the casting in the apartment is that, you know, those Ray Walston, for example, is like, you know, I don't know if he had done anything notable at that point, but it's a small role, but it, his, uh, he, he just, he makes something fascinating about, about one of the, he's one of the four guys, but, but he stands out. Um, and you, you know, casting is, my casting is everything really. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I, there was another thing that I've found interesting about um, this connective tissue between Cameron Crowe and Amy Hackerling too, who directed Fast Times. I'm curious if, they, if that was a deliberate choice. I, I mean, I know Cameron Crowe was, you know, obsessed uh, in a certain way with Billy Wilder. I'm curious if Ray Walson cast, being cast as Mr. Hand is something to do with the apartment. Um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised if if Crow was was pushing for him anyway, or just like who was the only was McMurray still alive? McMurray wouldn't have been doing teacher roles in in 1981. Yeah, probably not. And I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have been able to to do it the same way. I think by then his persona was so defined that that uh, it wouldn't have quite worked. I don't think. I don't think you would have bought him as the sort of cranky old man. Um, whereas yeah. you know, Walston was. I mean, it was pitch perfect, right? I mean, it's it's the it's the reason why that movie really really uh works um and i think you know with like casting with with eat wheaties i mean i got lucky obviously with the budget that we had to be able to get the people that that we got um but that it it really does half your work for you or more than half your work (laughs) yeah i mean i just as i can't picture anybody but jack lemon in in that role i'm like tony hale there's a quality that he brings that i recognize from all his other work and yet only works when he does it like if anyone else would have been doing a Tony Hale imitation, even if we didn't realize it at the time. Right. Right. And, and with Jack Lemon, there's something uh, interesting about uh, at least coming off of, uh, was he coming, was he coming right off of um, some like it hot? Yeah. Like they just made it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, he's flexing different muscles completely. Uh, and I think with Tony Hale, it's a similar thing. Like we've seen, we've seen him do that, the supporting comedic performance so well. And we've also seen him do some, you know, some more tender moments, but it's it very, at least at this point, I don't think there's a defining role for him where he's gotten to do a, kind of all of those things at once. Um, and I think with Jack Lemon, you know, he got nominated for this, right, Jack Lemon? Yeah. It's amazing. All the actors got nominated and none of them won. Right. It all the technical. A, yeah. W- winning is, uh, is all, subjective anyways but i think but i think that the people looked at him differently after this point on jack lemon i think it, it, it gave it gave him another another angle for his career not that he needed it i mean he was <laughs> but with tony hale i think I, I i hope that this this gets people to look at him in a little bit of a different light just because i think he, he's so phenomenal in the quiet moments i mean the to me the the best parts of editing this movie were, were just seeing his his performances when he's alone, looking at the computer screen. I, I, I didn't want to cut to the to the computer screen when he when he Google's himself or Bing's himself. Uh, I didn't want to cut to the computer screen just because whatever is see whatever you see on the on the screen isn't going to be as worthy as what you see in his face. Uh, and it's so expressive and it's so brilliant. Yeah, that is like it's true. You can just tell the story through. I, I'm sure there's. Oh, I'm, I'm locking up. I'm sure I can think of a dozen different examples of scenes where an actor's face registers so much more than what's needed in the scene, but they just, they give it all to us. But I guess, you know, again, it's, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of Shirley MacLaine saying, shut up and deal. And, you know, the way that she puts everything into it without even raising her voice or even intoning, like I, I, the, you, you sent me a PDF of the script, which was great to, to refresh myself just with the writing of it. And it ends with an exclamation point, but she does not use one. It's just so great that that choice, maybe that's why we remember it, right? Because there's that thing some movies do where if they go on for another second, they will be less than when you, when you are so excited that this, this is the end and you know it and you can feel it. And then it cuts and you go out on a cloud. And I wonder if she would, if she was more emphatic, if it would have landed the same way, because it is just a perfect note of calm that tells us that she's happy now. And that's the the most important thing about her arc, that it's going to oh, be yeah, okay for everybody. 
it's the best it's the best smile she gives all film in fact she doesn't smile very much in the film at all genuinely um not fully in the elevator i think when when baxter comes in she's she's happy to see him but that smile at the end it's like it's a different character yeah yeah, yeah. it's, ah, it's, it's a perfect sense. ending it's and i love that 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 last line in the script is <laughs> <laughs> that's about all there is story wise <laughs> and his willingness his willingness in the film to use that pun the 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 wise uh yeah. over and over it never gets old i know and it infects people because after you see it you start doing it yourself for a couple of weeks it just <laughs> never it never goes away i i continue to catch myself doing it every now and then whenever i'm thinking about it whenever i think about the apartment it creeps in and i think that's you know, Double Indemnity invents film noir in a way that, or or catalyzes it. Uh, Megan Abbott talked about this in her episode of the podcast, where before that, there are different kinds of mysteries. But Double Indemnity, it's not just the structure. It's not just the story material. It's the, there's a sense of the cruelty and the, and the unfairness of all of it that really comes into focus in a way that hadn't before between that and the lost weekend to like to make as many films that are as important to narrative and to genre as billy wilder did is something that i mean who else who else gets to do this over decades and decades and decades and to know to have not only to have the perfect final moment of the apartment but to follow some like it hot which has one of the best final moments of anything with another one that's just as good i mean jesus no wonder yeah, Cameron Crowe's in love with the guy. <laughs> He's absolutely. a template. Absolutely, it's uh, it, it's it's perfect. It's perfect. It's a perfect run. And I think there's been filmmakers who have had runs that were great, but certainly not as impactful to the you know, history of cinema. And that's the big. I think that's the big challenge of being a filmmaker now. Is like, you know, everything everything that has been done to this point has, you know. It's hard. It's hard to then. It's hard to be original. It's really hard to be original. I think you know my my goal with the Wheaties was um, was to tell a different kind of story, but nothing. There's nothing original about about the you know this this arc. Uh, but at the same time, I think having this character be at the center of the film is is it's just not it's just not done that often anymore. Um, you know, this awkward, the awkward guy is usually the weird brother uh, or the weird friend. Um, and to tell the story from his perspective, um, it's something that's that I you, just, you don't see it that often on TV. You do. You know, you see there's there's a lot of shows that are built around characters like this, but not a two hour film or an hour and a half film. Um, and that was the important part of casting about his his brother and his sister in laws. Like it needed to feel like in a in a normal version of this movie, um, in the more comfortable version of this movie, it's their movie. And Sid's just the you know annoying brother coming in and out. Um, but at least you know, but the apartment is, is is you can see the imprint of the apartment in and the way that it actually holds up now. It's you know through through 50, 60 years or whatever it's been since that movie came out. Um, and same thing with double indemnity, like those imprints are are permanent. So it's 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 interesting that Cameron Crowe, I think look, Cameron Crowe, he did he did create a new tone, the same way Judd Apatow kind of created a new tone, but it's a, but it's this. It's not it's not anything new. It's it's a, just a spin on 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 the apartment. Yeah, it's just a little looser and less structured. Yeah. And I think you yeah. could argue that the structure of the apartment is so important because it is like a, it moves like a shark through its story while yeah. still filling in the lives of everyone around it. Yeah. And, and that's the, the, that's where the jokes, that's where the jokes and the puns come in. It allows, it allows that, that pace to keep moving. Um, and I think, you know, that was, that was a goal with, with Eat Wheaties too, is to try and get the, you know, it's not, it's not a flat out comedy the way that I think, uh, you know, if you watch the trailer, it might feel a, like a little bit more of a lighter movie. Um, but, you know, to try and get the, the, the references and the, and the things that might connect an audience to the pace of it um, so that it feels like it's, like it's fun in moments that are not necessarily fun from a story perspective. I mean, it never gets dark. It never gets dark the way that the apartment gets dark at all. Um, but, you know, a guy losing his job and losing his, um, you know, losing his uh, lifeline um, to connectivity with his brother um, and being alone in his apartment is, is something uh, hopefully relatable, <laughs> but especially now. 
My thanks to Scott Abramovich, whose first feature, Eat Wheaties, is now available to rent or buy on VOD platforms across North America. Check it out. Tony Hill's great in it. Scott's not on Twitter, but you can follow his movie at Eat Wheaties Film, all one word, and you can find The Apartment on Blu-ray in an excellent special edition from Arrow Academy. There's also an MGM disc, which is pretty nice, and it's available on Apple TV and Google Play. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com, where I'm hosting a bunch of podcasts these days, and writing the weekly Now Streaming newsletter, to which you can subscribe at NowToronto.substack.com. And you can find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. Our theme song is by the last year. If you like it, or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you've been enjoying us. Every little bit helps, it truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're there. Stay home, watch movies, wear a mask if you go out. I'll see you next time.